If you want a real human voice for explanation, support me on GoFundMe. The link is in the description. Let's continue the video. 18-year-old Barbara Jean Jepson and her husband, Joe Jepson, lived in Van Nuys, California in January 1956. The couple got married the previous year. Barbara was four months pregnant. Joe worked for the National Air Guard. On January 31, 1956, Joe went to work early in the morning. Barbara was last seen shopping at 12.30 p.m. When Joe returned home, he found Barbara's body in their bed. She had been fatally stabbed. After the gruesome discovery, Joe first covered up his wife with a blanket and then called please. Detectives who responded to the Jefferson house that day found several items of evidence, such as a green army jacket with blood and hair follicles in a garage. One witness told police that a person was seen leaving the area that day wearing a green jacket. Another talked about seeing a man with big hands and big knuckles. Unfortunately, investigators back then didn't know how great DNA would eventually be at solving cold cases. So items such as the pillowcases, bed sheets, and a bloody rag found in the sink at the Jepson home were not collected. At the time, detectives believed that what happened to Barbara was linked to a series of assaults in the same area. They tracked down every man who's committed similar crimes in the area questioned them. Unfortunately, this did not lead anywhere, and the case went cold. In 2019, Los Angeles police detective, Rachel Evans, took another look at Barbara's case. It was the very first case she was assigned to after joining the cold case unit on her first day. A veteran detective handed her the case file and said good luck. By the time she started working on it, hundreds of detectives already combed through it over the past 60 years. It took Evans a week to read through the entire case file. Then she read it a second time and started taking notes. The third time she read through the file, she started noticing a lot of things. One of the things she picked up on was that there was no forced entry at the Jefferson's home. It seemed to Evans that Barbara knew the person who attacked her. She also noticed that no valuables were taken and nothing was out of place. As Evans reviewed the case, it wasn't long before she started focusing on one man, a man from Utah by the name of Montar Mers. Mers was born on May 24, 1911, in Mount Pleasant, Utah. In 1931, he married Cleo Reem, and the couple had one son and one daughter. They were later divorced and Murray's married another woman, Bernice, in the San Fernando Valley. That marriage also ended in divorce in 1945, with Bernice's citing cruelty. By then, Murs was an avid gambler, violent animals, a womanizer, and a raging alcoholic. He was also the suspect in many assault cases. By 1948, he moved in with a woman named Fern Spivey in San Fernando Valley and stayed with her for years. At the time Merz and Spiva began living together, she had a 10-year-old daughter from a previous relationship. That daughter is Barbara. Evans believed that Murray's abused her along the way because that was kind of his modus operandi. He would marry young women who had young girls and he would then go on to abuse them. In 1955, when Barbara married Joe, Murs married his fourth wife. This woman also had a young daughter. In 1960, 15 year old Marian Pedrada, who had a horse stable next to Murs and often rode horses with them, was found fatally stabbed. Then in 1962, Murs married his fifth wife, Ina. She too had a young daughter. In 1964, Mont Mers was arrested and accused of abusing a 14-year-old girl. Information on that case was hard for Evans to collect, because the case file had been destroyed. Although it is clear that Mers was involved in many crimes, this was the only victim for which he was arrested. Also, in 1964, while waiting for the trial, Mers showed up at a hospital with a gunshot wound. He claimed that it was an accidental shooting, who shot Mers and why was never determined. By 1965, all of Mers' crimes were coming to a head. He was given a polygraph test by police who asked him about what happened to Barbara Jefferson. He denied even knowing her. 
Investigators knew that he was at her funeral and that he knew her since she was 10 because he was married to her mom for some time. The polygraph test results concluded that Mers had definite guilty knowledge regarding the fate of Barbara. On August 15, 1965, while Mers was out of jail and with numerous questions looming about what else he had been involved with, his wife, Anna found underwear from a young girl in a drawer in their house. She confronted Mers about whether he had also been abusing that girl. The confrontation was apparently the last straw, as Mers proceeded to grab a gun from inside the house. He chased Ina into the street where he fatally shot her. He then went back inside the house and took his own life. Recently, a former stepdaughter of Mers called the police to tell him about 15-year-old Marian Pedrada, the girl who often rode horses with Mers and who was stabbed nine times. The stepdaughter told police that she was 10 years old at the time. She remembers that on the day that Mary Ann lost her life, Mers came into the house with a bloody knife and blood on his hands and clothing. The stepdaughter waited until he and his entire family were no longer alive until she told police. That's how scared she was. She told police that she still had nightmares of him every night. Evans would soon learn Mers had a pattern of never leaving his victims alone, even after he remarried or when his stepdaughters grew up and moved out of the house. According to Evans's research, five women were seen at Mers's funeral wearing black and crying. Evans said, so he was kind of a womanizer. He had all these women that he connected with and kind of kept. There's a lot of stories around him with these young girls that were abused by him. Until the day Barbara's mom passed away, even though they were no longer married, Mers would still visit her. That's why Evans believes on the day that Barbara's life was taken, Mers showed up at her residence and did not need to break into her house. As you'll remember, one of the witnesses saw a man wearing a green jacket with big hands and big knuckles. Big hands and big knuckles were something the Mers family were known for. A drawing of the person who was believed to have committed assault in the area showed a man who wore a plaid shirt. Evans said that Mers was also known to always wear a plaid shirt. He was wearing one in his mug shot taken in his 1964 arrest. Most of his victims had their hands bound during their attacks. The same was the case with Barbara. Despite the lack of DNA evidence that still exists today from the crime scene, Evans attempted to use today's DNA technology to help solve the case. After some extensive research, Evans was able to track down Merz's relatives still living in Utah in 2019, including his children. Evans gives big kudos to Draper Police and Unified Police for assisting her investigation. In September 2019, a search warrant for DNA was served to Merz's 87-year-old son. Merz's son passed away just two weeks after the DNA was collected. Unfortunately, it was ultimately determined there was not enough DNA from the crime scene to compare what the DNA collected from Mer's son. Evans said now that police have it preserved. They will revisit the case about every five years to see if advances in DNA technology get to the point so that the old DNA can finally be tested and compared to familial DNA from Mer's. Even though the DNA from the crime seemed too weak to prove 100% it was Mer's. Investigators believe now in 2022, they have more than enough evidence against Mers that if he were still alive, he would be found guilty of taking Barbara's life. Investigators have also been able to clear other suspects using the DNA. One of these people were Barbara's husband, Joe. Even though he was cleared by the police in the initial investigation, he lived the rest of his life a stigma surrounding him. Some members of the community questioned his innocence since he was the one who found his wife's body. Joe remarried and had two sons. Although the boys always believed their father was innocent, Evan said it was especially satisfying to be able to call them earlier this year and tell them that their father had conclusively been cleared. On the other side, Evan said Murr's grandchildren were upset when she told them what kind of person their grandfather really was. They had been told that he had passed away in a car accident. The grandchildren took the pictures they had of him out of their homes and threw it away. To solve Barbara's case, Evan said she took a page from the detectives of the 1950s pounding the pavement 
and turning over rocks looking for clues. But Evans also has her own gift for striking up conversations with people. People have a lot of info to share. So you sit back and listen to them, she said. In addition to having to prove herself to the veteran detectives, Evans admits she felt solving the case was something she had to do. Barbara Jefferson's family so that they could finally have some peace about what happened. She admits that at times, she felt guided as she worked to solve the six decades old cold case. I think people are crying from the dust for justice. Their families need it. I know it's not my family. But there's somebody who's still crying over this. You had a husband that passed away that people always had suspicion about. So for me, you get closure for the families to know that their dad was good, or their mom was great. You know you have some peace for them because they lived all these years with no peace. So for me and others I work with, we do this so the families can have rest. I can't bring them back, but the families can have rest. 25-year-old Lori Houts lived in Mountain View, California in 1992. She worked as a computer engineer. On September 5th, the same year, Lori's body was found in her car in Mountain View, near a garbage dump about a mile away from her workplace. Rope was used to strangle her and was still around her neck. Police found footprints on the inside of her windshield. Investigators quickly identified a prime suspect, John Kevin Woodward. He was allegedly openly jealous of Lori. Woodward had developed a romantic attachment to Lori's boyfriend who was also his roommate. In the late 1990s, Woodward was tried twice in the case, but it was unsuccessful. The case was dismissed by a judge for insufficient evidence after a jury could not reach a verdict after the second trial. Woodward's fingerprints were found located on the outside of Lori's car, but investigators could not prove he was inside of the car. Woodward moved to the Netherlands after the trial. Later on, he would become the president and CEO of Bay Area company ReadyTech. It is an online training company. Investigators did not give up on Lori's case and still followed up on leads and searched for evidence. In late 2020, investigators resubmitted all the forensic evidence they had for further analysis. Over 80 latent fingerprints that were collected at the crime scene were re-examined by the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office Identification Unit. This resulted in even more fingerprints matching Woodward. His fingerprints were found in places only the person who took her life could have touched John Woodward was apprehended by police at JFK Airport in New York on July 9, 2022 after arriving from Amsterdam. If convicted, Woodward faces life in prison. Deputy District Attorney Rob Baker of the Santa Clara County's D. A office had this to say. I'm thrilled that we have a second chance to seek justice for Lori after nearly 30 years. It's so rare that new evidence has discovered decades after a case is dismissed, giving us another shot of holding Mr. Woodward accountable. The arrest of Mr. Woodward is a testament to advances in forensic science. Without those advances, we never would have been able to refile this case. The fact that police didn't start regularly collecting DNA evidence until maybe 20 to 25 years ago makes cold case investigations very challenging. For example, Lori's personal might have had a lot of DNA on them, but testing was impossible because they were contaminated with fingerprint dust. Lori's family issued a statement Lori and House was a beloved family member and friend to many. Although she was only five feet tall, she had a huge heart, and her humor and spunk were endearing to all. The way Lori lived and treated people was a stunning example of what was right in the world. She was a gem to so many, but her bright life was taken from us at the age of 25. We are hopeful that justice can finally be served for Lori, incredibly appreciative of law enforcement agency who have never given up on her. To keep her memory alive, Lori's family established the Lori House Memorial Girls Athletic Scholarship, whose donations go to graduating female seniors. On the morning of July 15, 1982,
grave digger George Keyes discovered the body of a Caucasian woman in the rear of the Cedar Ridge Cemetery in Blairstown, New Jersey. The body was found lying on its back just over a steep bank that leads to a creek below. The victim's face had been beaten beyond recognition with an undetermined object. The medical examiner estimated that she was in her late teens or early twenties. Examination indicated that the girl had attempted to fight back or defended from her attacker as trauma to her hands and arms was observed. The body was clad in a red short sleeve shirt and a skirt. After seeing images of the girl's clothing in a newspaper, a witness named Emery Latimer told officials that she remembered seeing a girl wearing the same clothing as the victim, purchasing cigarettes on July 13, 1982. Just two days before her body was found, Latimer stated that she was shopping with her daughter at a supermarket across from the cemetery and observed she was able to describe the victim's clothing. The shirt and skirt themselves were traced to a manufacturer in the Midwestern United States. Some people also said that they bought similar clothes at a store in Long Island, New York. The victim was buried on January 22, 1983, after she had remained unidentified for over five months. Since number one knew her identity, she was named Princess Doe. Donated funds were used to pay for a coffin and headstone. The headstone was engraved with a text, Princess Doe, missing from home remembered by all. This is the first reconstruction made of Princess Doe, but did not lead to anything useful, unfortunately. For many years, Princess Doe was thought to be Diane Janice Dye. She was a missing teenager from San Jose, California, who vanished on July 30, 1979. This theory was supported by several law enforcement officials in the state of New Jersey. They went as far as to hold a press conference identifying Diane Dye as Princess Doe. In 2003, Princess Doe's DNA was compared with a sample of Diane's mother, Patricia. It was then conclusively determined that Princess Doe was not Diane Dye. In 1999, a woman named Donna Kellaw was arrested in California for attempting to commit welfare fraud. When questioned by investigators, Donna decided to reveal that her husband, Arthur Kinlaw, is responsible for taking the lives of many women. Donna said that she was at the cemetery when Arthur took Princess Doe's life in July of 1982. Donna did not give any detailed information, and since Princess Doe had not been identified, it was difficult to prove that she was telling the truth and that Arthur was responsible. Arthur was, however, found guilty on a lot of other crimes. Investigators did get Donna to tell a forensic artist what the victim looked like. This is the sketch that was then made. One theory was submitted that Prince's Dome may have been a runaway and could have been an individual using false names while employed at a hotel in Ocean City, Maryland. In 2012, the case was looked into again. A new composite sketch was made depicting her as a blonde, not brunette, like in the last sketch. Also in 2012, a sample of her hair and tooth were examined through an isotope analysis and indicated that the victim was most likely born in the United States. The sample of her hair indicated that she had lived at least 7 to 10 months in the Midwestern or Northeastern United States. The tooth sample indicated that she could possibly be from Arizona. It was also believed that the victim spent a long period of time at Long Island, New York. The case was featured on America's Most Wanted in 2012 in hopes to generate new information. The same year, the most recent reconstruction was broadcast on CNN. Additional composites of Princess Doe were made by Carl Kaufman that illustrated her clothing. In 2021, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children partnered with investigators and Australia Forensics to help identify Princess Doe. On June 18, 2021, investigators received the news that Australia Forensics agreed to extract DNA and construct a DNA profile. On February 10, 2022, Australia Forensics relayed to investigators that the creation of a DNA data file was successful. The results were then sent to the National Center for Missing Exploited Children's Consulting Genealogists from Innovative Forensic Investigations. The managing officer was Jennifer Moore, 
who agreed to perform unlimited genealogy free of charge. February 22, 2022, Innovative Forensics announced to investigators that they had a candidate for Princess Doe. Investigators then went to West Babylon, New York, where they met with Robert Olinick Jr. They believed he was the brother of Princess Doe. They also collected a DNA sample from Princess Doe's sister, which mitotyping technology used to build a mitochondrial DNA profile. The Union County Prosecutor's Office Forensic Laboratory assisted by creating an STR DNA profile through the victim's sister's DNA sample. Mitotyping technology then sent the DNA profile to the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification. On April 20, 9, 2022, the center identified Princess Stu as Don Allen York. She was formally announced on July 15, 2022, the 40th anniversary of her discovery. Her brother Robert said that Don left their home at her mother's request and was never seen or heard from again. Arthur Kenlaw has been interviewed again, and he confessed. Kenlaw remains in prison at the Sullivan Correctional Facility in Fallsburg, New York. Investigators are now looking to piece together Don's movements in the time leading up to her demise. Don Rita Olenek was just 17 years old when her life was taken. 21-year-old Heather and Williams lived in an apartment in Leon Valley. Texas in 2005. On February 22, Heather's friends got concerned when they could not reach her. The friends entered her apartment through a sliding glass door, and everyone's worst fears were realized as they found Heather's body in her bedroom. Heather's hands had been severed. Her clothes were burned in an apparent effort to conceal evidence. It was also determined that she had been assaulted. Neighbors of Heather told police they heard her arguing with a man the previous day. They described shuffling sounds and then silence at 5 a.m. in the morning. Investigators questioned a lot of people close to Heather. One of those people was Jose Baldwin Flores. He went to high school with her and stayed in touch afterwards. Flores was also one of the last to see her alive. Flores denied any involvement and the DNA collected from Heather's body that belonged to the suspect was not strong enough to match to anyone. Six years later, in 2011, 30-year-old Esmerera's life was taken in a similar fashion to Heather's. She lived in San Antonio, Texas. Her body was found tied to her bed on March 2nd. She had been bludgeoned and strangled. Another fire had been set in an attempt to conceal evidence. This time, set multiple places and large enough that firefighters arrived to put down the blaze. A month after Esmeralda's life was taken, Jose Flores was arrested in connection with her case. The charges against him were dropped a month later. A request to further investigate the case was denied. In 2015, then-district attorney, Nico LaHood decided to take another look. Then in December 20, 16, Florza was again arrested. This time, he was charged with taking the lives of Heather and Esmeralda. DNA linked him to both cases. According to San Antonio officials, the pandemic slowed down the pace of corporate proceedings considerably. In early 2022, District Judge Melissa Skinner Skinner decided that all sides had waited long enough. But then on the eve of jury selection for the trial, floristic responsibility. The 41-year-old Flores was then sentenced to three separate life sentences. Heather's mother Donna Ellis had this to say during a victim impact statement read during the sentencing. Every fiber of my being wants you to suffer and live in fear just as my Heather did. Just as Esmeralda did. Today, I take back my life. I forgive you. Esmeralda's family had a victim advocate read a letter to Flores. The letter reportedly wished him pain and suffering. Five-year-old Stephanie Haybert lived in Wageman, Louisiana in 1978. One summer's day in June, Stephanie left her Astro Lane home at about 2.30 p.m. She headed to a friend's house to play. Stephanie was wearing a pink checker top, pink shorts, and her ice-blue prescription glasses. She never made it to her friend's house, 
and she did not return home for dinner. Her parents, Joyce and Donald Haybert, called 911 to report her missing. Joyce was quoted as saying, This is hell. I wouldn't wish this on anyone, not even the devil. A multi-day search of the family's neighborhood ensued. The FBI joined the case. Investigators ran down tip after tip. The Habers even hired Syke, but no sign of Stephanie could be found. Five months later, a hunter discovered Stephanie's partial skeletal remains in a wooded area down a shell road in Royal St. Charles Parish in Louisiana. This is about 20 miles from Stephanie's home. Her body was tied up against a tree. Investigators could not determine how she lost her life, but could confirm that she had been assaulted. Detectors focused on Stephanie's then 16-year-old neighbor, Roger Alexander. Stephanie was friends with his little sister, and she attended a sleepover at their house the night before she disappeared. Alexander maintained his innocence. On the day Stephanie went missing, he was a few blocks away at his cousin's house on Dandelion Drive, helping repair a car. Several witnesses vouched for him. Still, investigators insisted that Alexander was responsible. St. Charles Parish Prasic presented a case against him to a grand jury, but they declined to indict Alexander. The Wagman Nay neighbors who searched through the summer heat for Stephanie watched them their lawns as investigators repeatedly searched Alexander's home. Even after a 2008 DNA test excluded him, authorities did not declare him innocent. Suspicion also fell in 70-year-old Daniel Parks. He was a friend of the Haber family who babysat Stephanie. In 2014, he was sentenced to life in prison, convicted of assaulting a 7-year-old girl in 1979. The victim in this case testified that Parks once told her she would end up like poor Stephanie. Parks denied harming Stephanie, and investigators could not find any evidence that he was involved. In 2003, Stephanie's mother Joyce contacted a man named Michael, who is the chief of the district attorney's victims and witness assistant division. Mikhail recalls that Joyce said to him when they first met. She kept saying, her case is just sitting there. Please do something. All I know is my child was tied to a tree and left for animals to get her. Mikkel met with prosecutors and detectives seeking new ways to identify the person responsible. In 2012, a distraught Jay Franklin reached out to Mikkel and said that he knows who took Stephanie's life. Jay said that his father, Jason Franklin Sr., was responsible. Jason was a U.S. Army veteran. He married Joyce Vinette in 1970 in New Orleans and worked as an electrician's helper. The couple bought a home on Esther Lane about five houses from Stephanie's home. Jason was a serial predator who targeted children. In 1966, was convicted of attempted assault on a young girl. Jason targeted children who didn't tell because they had been threatened or were too horrified about what had happened. Other times, they weren't believed. Jay Franklin reached out to Macau because his wife, Michelle Franklin, had convinced him he'd never know peace until he spoke up. Since childhood, he had bounced between homes, abused and traumatized by what he had been through. He was mentally damaged. Michelle Franklin said, he didn't know what love was until he got with me. Over the next nine years, Jay Franklin revealed physical abuse he had suffered at Jason Franklin Sr.'s hands, and how it links to Stephanie's case. Jay said that his father beat him and assaulted him between the ages of two and six. Jason Franklin Sr. also used his son to lure other victims, usually young girls, to their home under the pretense of a play date. Young Jay Franklin was sometimes forced to take part. Jay then told Invest to a car and told Vinette to follow. They then drove to a wooded area where Stephanie's body would later be found. Jason Franklin Sr. stripped Stephanie of her clothes and took Polaroid pictures of the child, forcing Jay to pose with her. Jay remembers Stephanie tearfully declaring, I'm telling my daddy. He believes this may have sealed her fate. Vanet then left with Jay. Jay told investigators that he saw his father binding Stephanie to a tree as they pulled away. When confronted by detectives, Joyce Vanette denied any involvement and called her son a liar. 
While speaking with investigators, Jay Franklin took detectives to some of Jason Franklin Sr.'s favorite hunt spots. They eventually ended up in a rural area of St. Charles Parish. Without realizing it, he directed them to the scene where Stephanie was found. Despite Jay Franklin's testimony, it still took authorities years to prepare the case. They had to determine what evidence was admissible, what charges he'd be eligible for, and definitely rule out the other suspects. Jay Franklin's credibility was bolstered by the statements of another victim who came forward. It was a 51-year-old woman whose story of childhood assault matched the version of events he told. She had never before disclosed the assault. In 2018, 76-year-old Jason Franklin Sr. was arrested in connection to Stephanie's case. Her parents Donald and Joyce lived long enough to see him arrested. Both of them passed away in 2020. Unfortunately, the case never made it to trial. In January of 2022, Jason Franklin Sr. lost his life due to a respiratory illness while in prison. In June of 2022, 50-year-old Jay Franklin also lost his life due to a drunk driver. Investigators with the cold case team described it as a heartbreaking loss. Jay's stepmother, Kathy Vanette, said, I think he's the bravest person I ever met to be able to basically rip his whole life apart and put it out there. Kathy Vanette is married to Jay Franklin's stepfather, Henry Vanette. Henry was married at one point to Joyce Vanette, Jay Franklin's mother. Without the suspect and the main witness, investigators officially closed Stephanie's case. Vanette currently lives in Alabama and hasn't been formally charged or arrested yet. 22-year-old Christine McCorder and her 31-year-old aunt, Beatrice Daniels, were fatally shot between 6 p.m., January 2, and 11.50 a.m., January 3, 2009. In their apartment at the Chestnut Terrace Housing Complex in Huntington County, Pennsylvania, the women were both shot in the head. Christine's four-month-old daughter and four-year-old son were left behind in the apartment. Neighbors discovered the women's bodies after the four-year-old son asked them for help. Droplets of blood were taken into evidence from the crime scene by investigators. The initial DNA report concluded blood collected from the stairs and interior doors of the apartment were all deposited from an unidentified male. Over the years as DNA advanced, a DNA profile of the suspect could be created using the droplets. On March 14, 2016, Trooper David Clement submitted the DNA profile to DNA Solutions. They then forwarded it to Parabon Nano Labs based in Reston, Virginia. Parabon Nano Labs used the DNA to create an image of what the suspect might look like. It showed a black male with brown to black hair, medium to light complexion, and green or hazel eyes. On July 12, 2018, Trooper Dana Martini contacted Tom Shaw a certified forensic artist and employee for Parabon Nano Labs. He was asked to conduct a genetic genealogy analysis of the DNA recovered at the crime scene. On October 9, 2018, Parabon provided a report on the genetic genealogy of the DNA and identified Mariko Johnson as a potential match. Johnson's appearance also matched with the image of the suspect they had created. Investigators found that Christine was acquainted with Johnson's then-girlfriend Cynthia Swan. Investigators interviewed Johnson for the first time at his home on December 12, 2019. Johnson admitted that he knew Christine and Beatrice because Cynthia but denied ever setting foot in Christine's home. Johnson provided investigators with a DNA sample via a swab of his mouth. The sample was then sent off for analysis by the State Police Lab in Harrisburg on December 19, 2019. On January 3, 2020, the lab reported that Johnson's DNA matched blood evidence found on the stairs and interior doors at the crime scene. Investigators then compared Johnson's time card to the estimated time Christine and Beatrice's lives were taken. On January 22, 2020, the state police received time cards from Johnson's then-employee, the New York Department of Corrections, which confirmed he was off work January 2, 2009, and started his January 3rd shift at 7 a.m. 
State police estimate the time it takes to travel the 294 miles between Christine Beatrice's home and Johnson's then workplace is 4 hours and 43 minutes. Please check to see if Johnson had access to a 25 caliber firearm. The type used to shoot Ms. McCorder and Ms. Daniels 23, 2020. Troopers Thomas and Martini interviewed the suspect's half-brother, Carol Brodas Johnson Jr. of Connecticut, who told the officers he thought his late father owned a 25 caliber and that Mariko Johnson inherited their father's when he passed away in 1998. Thomas and Martini interviewed Cynthia Swan, Johnson's ex-girlfriend, February 21, 2020 and learned from Swan that she was originally supposed to travel with Christine from Philadelphia to Mount Union on January 1, 2009, and stay for the weekend but decided that the last minute to remain in Philadelphia with the man, Benjamin June. Swan told troopers it was around this time Johnson found out Swan was having an affair with June. Please say the last incoming text on Christine's cell phone was from Swan asking Christine to call her. Please say Christine did not respond to Swan's text. On July 28, 2020, Thomas and Martini spoke with Robert Sean Spade, the father of Christine's oldest child. Spade told the troopers he visited Christine, Beatrice, and the children the evening of January 2, 2009. Spade reported the women kept the apartment very clean and that he didn't observe blood-like drops anywhere in the apartment and that it was unlike them to leave a spill or mess. In May of 2022, 47-year-old Mariko Tyrone Johnson was arrested in Newport News, Virginia, and charged with taking the lives of Christine and Beatrice. He will soon be transported to Pennsylvania by state police to face charges against him. 30-year-old Patricia Stichler lived in Sylvania, Ohio with her three daughters in 1985. She was divorced and worked for more than seven years with the 21st Century Health Spas. Patricia's body was found by her 11-year-old daughter in the early morning hours of January 2, 1985. Someone had entered their home and slashed her throat while she slept. Patricia's three daughters were sleeping in their beds down the hall when the crime occurred. A window in the home had been left open though it was unclear whether it was opened by Patricia or someone else. Investigators said that there were no signs of forced entry. Fortunately, there was a DNA sample from the crime scene that belonged to an unknown male. In 1985, authorities were unable to identify the suspect, despite a thorough investigation. Tuna detectives were assigned to the case in 1998, but once again, it remained unsolved even with the help of the Ohio Bureau of Investigation. Recently, the DNA profile became the focus of the investigation. Please enlisted the help of multiple agencies, including the Ohio BCI Forensic Lab and Lucas County Prosecutor's Office. They also established a new partnership with Advanced DNA, Forensic Genealogy. Using genetic genealogy, experts determined the DNA belonged to Michael Malas, whom investigators later determined was less than a hundred feet from Patricia's home on the night her life was taken. He was 17 years old at the time and in high school. He lived on the same street as Patricia. His residence was across the street and just six houses away. Please say Melas was not acquainted with Patricia or her family and would not have had any reason to be inside the victim's home. Melas kicked the bucket before he could face prosecution. He joined the U.S. Army after graduating high school and lost his life in a single-vehicle car accident in 1989, while stationed in North Carolina for Patricia's surviving daughters who vowed to see their mother's case solved. Questions remained. How did he get into their home? Did he see them? Why didn't he take their lives? Kristen Kelly, one of the daughters, said help us understand the unknowns. Help her children in their suffering because it's not fair to any of us. 12-year-old Laisha Michelle Jackson lived in Montgomery County, Texas, in 1979. She left her home on September 7 to spend the day at a community pool in her neighborhood. When she did not return home, 
her family got worried and called 911. The following day, her glasses were found at a local intersection, but no pipeline in Montgomery County. An autopsy report revealed that she had been assaulted before her life was taken. Investigators collected DNA that belonged to the suspect from her body and stored it to be used later. Detectives began an extensive investigation into her case that lasted for years. And while all leads were explored, the case eventually became cold. In 2021, investigators decided to take another look. They made use of a new technology called MVAC. The MVAC system enables investigators to solve more crime through better DNA collection. It expands potential evidentiary items by collecting DNA from porous and rough surfaces. Montgomery County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Squad utilized this new technology in October of 2021 to successfully extract unknown DNA from Lacha's clothing collected at the crime scene. From there, the unknown DNA was sent to Texas DPS forensic scientists, who were able to develop a DNA profile of the person that took her life. In 2022, investigators submitted the profile into the FBI's Combined DNA Index System, Cody's, and determined that it matched with a man named Gerald Dwight Casey. Casey had been executed in 2002 for taking someone else's life in Montgomery County in 1989. Casey, who was 34 years old back then and had accomplished 36-year-old Carla Smith, still guns from a man named Daryl Pennington in 1989. When they arrived at Pennington's home, they instead found his roommate, Sonia Lynn Howell. Casey beat her with the home telephone and went on to shoot her nine times. He then dumped her body in a wooded area. He was convicted in 1991. Before ending Howell's life, Casey had been in and out of prison for multiple convictions, including burglary and multiple drug charges. The Montgomery County Sheriff's Office has noted that this marks the oldest cold case solved by their department to date. 76-year-old Helen Vogt lived in Erie, Pennsylvania, in July 1988. She was recently widowed as her husband Herbert passed away four months earlier in February. Erie police were called to Helen's townhouse at 7.15 a.m. on July 23, 1988. A witness grew alarmed after seeing Helen's 1988 Buick LeSabre back out of her garage at a high rate of speed with the driver of the car wearing a towel wrapped around his head. The witness went to check on Helen and found her body and then called the police. Helen was stabbed with two kitchen knives and a two-pronged fork. An autopsy determined that she had suffered more than 50 stab wounds to her hands, face, neck, chest, and back. A witness who lived next door told the police that she heard muffled sounds consistent with screaming coming from Helen's townhouse at about 10.30 p.m. the previous evening. The witness also said she heard noises of furniture moving, as well as people going up and down the stairs. Investigators described the house as ransacked. Dresser drawers were pulled open, and items were thrown about the townhouse. Helen was known to keep money bonds, and personal paperwork in a briefcase at her home, but when detectives opened it, the briefcase was empty. Other items missing included credit cards, a white purse, a watch, and Helen's diamond ring that she never took off. Detectives found no sign of forced entry. They did, however, find blood on a washcloth in Helen's shower. There was also blood taken from Helen's kitchen sink. It did not belong to her, so police theorized that the suspect accidentally cut himself during the attack. On August 21, 1988, about a month after Helen's life was taken, her car was found in Dayton, Ohio. It was located in a parking garage next to a Greyhound bus station. Investigators also found that three days before Helen lost her life, she met with her lawyers and changed her will. She left half her estate to her daughter, Bonnie. The other half was to be split between her two grandchildren, Bethany and Jeremy. Investigators got a search warrant to obtain samples of blood, saliva, hair, and complete handprints from Helen's family members to be compared to the blood found at the crime scene. It was submitted to the Pennsylvania State Police Crime Lab in 1990, 
but results were inconclusive as DNA was not advanced enough. In 2022, the DNA was again entered into the crime lab. This time, it confirmed that Helen's grandson, Jeremy Brock, was responsible. He was 21 years old back in 1988. In July of 2022, 55-year-old Jeremy C. Brock was arrested at his home in Austin, Texas. He is currently at Travis County Jail in Austin and will be taken to Erie County, Pennsylvania, soon. Erie Police Chief Dan Spazarni said at the news conference that with the advancement of forensic technology, the Pennsylvania State Police Crime Lab in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, was able to reanalyze the previously submitted evidence. In September 2019, human remains belonging to a black male were found on the roof of a building in downtown Biloxi, Mississippi, near the 800 block of Barth Street. The building was abandoned and had been unoccupied for at least 15 years. There were no clues to the unknown person's identity, and investigators could not find a missing person's record that matched what they knew about the remains. In August 2021, the Mississippi State Medical Examiner's Office, Biloxi Police Department, and Harrison County Coroner's Office teamed up with Authramic to use forensic-grade genome sequencing to help generate new leads that might identify the unknown man or his next of kin. Authram built a genealogical profile from the skeletal remains sent by the Mississippi State Medical Examiner's Office, and Carla Davis, a Mississippi native and genealogist, performed genealogical research. Investigative leads were passed back to law enforcement, and an additional investigation by Biloxi investigators confirmed that the identity of the unknown man found on the roof was Gary Lee White from Jackson, Mississippi. He was born on August 29, 1952. At the time of his discovery in 2019, he would have been 67 years old. How he lost his life remains unclear and an investigation continues into the circumstances. But for his family, it brings great relief that the what happened to him part of the case is now solved. 25-year-old Nading Major lived with her husband, Mark, and their infant son, Dan, in an apartment in Willoughby, Ohio in 1980. When Mark returned home from work on January 11, 1980, he found Nadine's body in their dining room. She had been stabbed more than 40 times. Just a few feet from a body was their son still in his living room playpen. Fortunately, he was unharmed. During the initial investigation, Willoughby police determined that Nadine's life was taken sometime between 1.15 p.m. and 4.45 p.m. There were no signs of forced entry nor evidence that she had been assaulted. Nothing seemed to be missing from the home except the weapon, which came from Nading's kitchen. The person who took her life did, however, leave something behind. His blood was found on Nading's shirt. A significant amount of blood belonging to an unknown male was located on Nading's shirt. Some of the suspect's blood on Nading's shirt was in the form of perpendicular drops, which indicated that the suspect was standing on top of Nadine while he was bleeding. A neighbor of Nadine noticed a canary yellow Dodge Dart parked in the rear of their apartment complex around the time her life was taken. It's not a car that belonged to anyone living in a complex. Investigators followed up on the lead, but unfortunately it did not lead anywhere and the case went cold. In 2015, police received new information based on the DNA found on Nadine's clothing after establishing a partnership with the Lake County Crim Lab the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigations, and the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit. They later teamed up with Lake County Prosecutor's Office and Parabon Nanolabs to build a family tree from the DNA profile, ultimately leading them to Stephen Joseph S. Simkak through the use of genetic genealogy. Investigators compared the male DNA from blood on Nadine's shirt to one of Simkak's biological children and found a match. People who knew Simkak then confirmed he had owned a canary yellow Dodge Dart back in 1980. Authorities then looked into Simkak's work record from his 37-year career at Lincoln Electric Company in Euclid, Ohio, 
which is less than 10 miles from Willoughby. In 1980, Asankak only missed one day of work. The day Nadine's life was taken, Asankak was due in for a second shift that day and called in sick. Please also learn that at the time Asankak had other jobs. Delivering flowers for Wycliffe Floor and working with Beat Antonio's winery in Wycliffe, just a few miles southwest of both his and Needing's home. Sikak retired in 2002 and moved to Bemis Point, New York, about 60 miles southwest of Buffalo, according to police. He passed away at 79 in 2018, leaving behind a wife, three biological children, and two stepchildren. Nading's husband, Mark Major had this to say at a press conference held by police. He stole Nading from her family and friends. Most of all, he stole Nadine from me and my son. How could he get up every day and look himself in the mirror knowing what he did? She did not deserve this, he continued. If there's a place in hell, I know he's in it, and I hope he rots there. Mark continued that Nadine did not know Asan Kak, leaving loved ones and investigators puzzled about a possible motive. Nadine's son Dan had this to say at the press conference. I am angry that Stephen passed away as a free and carefree citizen before he could be identified, as well as caught. And in turn, given the ability for questions to be asked and justice to be served. On February 26, 1999, human remains were discovered in a wooded area near the intersection of Clifton Spring Road and Clifton Spring Church Road in Decatur, Georgia. An autopsy concluded that the remains belonged to an African-American boy between the ages of five and seven. He was wearing a blue and white plaid shirt, red denim jeans, and brown Timberland boots. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, authorities were unable to determine the cause and manner in which the boy lost his life. Unfortunately, they were also unable to identify him. The case went cold for many years. In May of 2020, a tipster came forward. She saw an artistic rendering of the unidentified child that had been distributed by authorities and contacted the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. She told investigators about a woman she knew by the name of Teresa and Bailey Black. Black was living in Charlotte, North Carolina, with her six-year-old son, William Deshaun Hamilton. In December of 1998, Without notice, she withdrew William from school and then moved to Atlanta, Georgia. Black later returned to Charlotte the following year, but without William. According to detectives, she gave conflicting accounts at the time regarding her son's whereabouts. The tips are believed that the boy found in Georgia was William because they looked similar. The Decod County Police Department, along with County Cuters, later followed up on the lead and resumed actively investigating the case. Early in 2022, DNA linked Black to the child's remains. She was arrested in Phoenix, Arizona, on June 20, 9, 2022. She is currently waiting to be taken to Georgia. Authorities have not specified how William's life was taken or a possible motive. Angeline Hartman, who is the Director of Communications at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, said, This case is the perfect example of why we never give up hope. For more than two decades, a woman in Charlotte followed her gut feeling that something wasn't right. She made phone calls, scoured the internet, and talked to anyone who would listen. We're grateful she never stopped until she found that rendering of William online and gave investigators the missing piece to help solve the 23-year-old mystery. William was a bright and artistic six-year-old, who possessed a keen sense of humor, according to those who knew him. Investigators are now seeking the public's assistance to help piece together a more concrete timeline of Black and William's movement authorities say Black worked at a now-defunct Atlanta strip club known as Pleasers and may have been getting assistance from the Atlanta Day Shelter for Women and Children for a brief period. 80-year-old Antonio Rodriguez and a 77-year-old wife Luce lived in Cleveland, Texas in 2005. Antonio was a World War II veteran, the couple had been a beloved fixture in Cleveland, and were known for their kindness. 
They operated a small Mexican food restaurant from their home to serve shift workers at a local plywood mill. On April 14, 2005, the couple's daughter, Carolina Tejeda, went to their home to make lunch for them. They didn't answer the door, so she thought they might be asleep but still entered to make them lunch. Carolina then found her father's body on the floor of their bedroom and her mother's body in their bed. They had both been beaten and strangled. Police dogs were able to track the scent of a suspect across some railroad tracks to a nearby apartment complex, but were unable to lead investigators any further than that. Blood from an unknown suspect was found on a large rug in couple's home, and the DNA was entered into the FBI's combined DNA index system. But there were no hits at the time. For years, the case went cold, then in March of 2021, when investigators again entered the DNA sample in Dakota, they found a match. The DNA was linked to Shelley Susan Thompson Lemoin. She was serving time in a Texas prison for an unrelated drug offense. Lemoin denied knowing the Rodriguez family and having any involvement in crime. Another DNA sample was taken from her at the prison, and it was matched to the DNA found at the crime scene back in 2005. She was arrested on the 8th of July of 2022 outside her parole office in connection to the Rodriguez case. Cleveland Police Chief Darrell Braz Sad had this to say after the arrest was made. Sometimes such small pieces of evidence can solve the case. And in this case, it was that piece of carpet that was found inside the home that had a speck of blood on it. For the couple's family, it was a welcome development in the case that has continued to haunt the family. Their daughter, Carolina Tejeda, who made the horrific discovery, said I knew it would come. I didn't know this long, but I knew this day would come. The community has always kept our parents in their prayers, and we're just very thankful, and God is good. She also said that she believes more people could have been involved in the slang, and that she did not know and had never seen Thompson Lemoyne. Martin Rodriguez, another one of the couple's ten children, said that he believes the arrest is the first step in helping the family heal from the tragedy. I've seen the hand of God at work today. Our family is extremely relieved that there is activity in our parents' case. We are grateful for the efforts of the Texas Rangers, particularly Ranger Best, Cleveland Police Department, and the Liberty County District Attorney's Office. They have shown that they do care about what happened to our parents. They have restored our hope and faith in the justice system. 19-year-old Lindsay Sue Beachler lived in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania in 1975. She had just recently got married. At about 8.45 p.m. on December 5, 1975, Lindsay's aunt and uncle stopped by her apartment to exchange recipes. Instead, they found a horrific scene. There was blood on the front door, the entranceway wall, and on the carpet. They found Wendy's body on the living room floor. She had been stabbed 19 times, two different knives, and assaulted. Investigators collected all forensic evidence they could at the crime scene. There were no signs of forced entry. Witnesses also didn't hear or see anything strange. In 1997, as DNA advanced, Detectives Lancaster County District Attorney's Office submitted Lindy's underwear for DNA analysis. The lab found male DNA on it and could then create a DNA profile of the suspect recently. In 2019, investigators teamed up with C.C. Moore, who is the chief genetic genealogist at Paraben Nano Labs. Paribon created a composite sketch of the suspect based on the DNA evidence they had. In 2020, C.C. used DNA to build a family tree of the suspect. She found that he had deep roots in the local Lancaster community. She also found that the family tree of this unknown suspect contained many recent immigrant families for tiny town of Gasparina, Italy. Finally, the search was narrowed down to 68-year-old David Sinopoli. Investigators learned that Sinopoli lived in the same apartment complex as Lindy. To ensure that it was his DNA that was left at the crime scene, authorities and surveilling Sinopoli, who didn't go out much in public. On February 11th, 2022, investigators were able to obtain Sinopoli's DNA from coffee cup he drank from and threw in the garbage at the airport. 
DNA found on Snowball's coffee cup was compared to DNA identified from the male DNA on Lindy's underwear. In June, investigators learned that the two spots of blood found on Lindy's pantyhose was consistent with the DNA profile obtained from her underwear. Detectives had long believed that the suspect had cut himself during the attack. Sinopoli is being held in Lancaster County Prison without bail. Investigators do not believe Sinopoli and Lindsay knew each other. It was just a crime of opportunity. On July 11, 1983, the body of 41-year-old Linda Lonson was found at the end of Memorial Highway in Tampa, Florida. Investigators said that she had been assaulted, shot in the head, and then dumped in the bushes. Linda was a freelance photographer who grew up in New York and had moved to Tampa as an adult. About a month later in August 19, 1983, the body of 19-year-old Barbara Grant was found behind a death office in the Tampa Heights area. She had also been assaulted before her life was taken. Barbara was described as a friendly outgoing teenager from Tampa, who had a job at the mall and liked to walk to stay fit. A man by the name of Robert Dubois soon became a suspect in Barbara's case. He was convicted because a bite mark analysis expert said that Robert was responsible for a bite mark on Barbara's face. Dubois denied any involvement and contacted the Innocence Project. In 2020, with the help of advancements in DNA and the Conviction Review Unit, Du Bois was exonerated after spending 37 years in jail for a crime he did not commit. The Conviction Review then went on to do more DNA testing to see who was responsible for taking the life of Barbara Graham. After further DNA testing, they realized that not one man was responsible, but two. They also determined that these two were responsible for many crimes in the Tampa area in 1983. The two men are 58-year-old Amos Robinson and 57-year-old Abraham Scott. They took the lives of both Barbara Graham and Linda Lanson. They are already serving life sentences, but investigators want to make sure that their crimes against Barbara and Linda do not go unpunished. Investigators are working hard to find other crimes that Robinson and Scott are responsible for. Linda Sheffield, who was Linda Lonson's niece, close friend and roommate had this to say. When it happened, it was shock and disbelief, whereas now it's more retrospective. This is a day I never thought would come. So to have somebody accountable for what they did, not only to my aunt, but everyone else and every other family they touched is beyond anything I would have expected. It means everything to me. State Attorney Andrew Warren, who announced the two indictments in August 2022 said, When we created the Conviction Review Unit, it was the first in Tampa Bay and one of the first in Florida. The CRU reviews plausible claims of innocence. It's there to safeguard against wrongful convictions. As we see today, in the rare case when the wrong person is convicted, the actual criminals get away with the crime. But for those victims, that stops now. This shows the power of a conviction review unit to right wrongs, uncover the truth, and deliver justice for victims. Even after almost 40 years. 23-year-old Shannon Lloyd lived in Orange County, California in 1986. She was a tomboy who loved horses and had an adventurous soul. On May 20th first, Shannon's body was found inside her bedroom in Garden Grove. She'd been assaulted and strangled. Shannon's older brother, Tom Lloyd, had this to say at the time. It's hard for me to fathom how anyone could take into the person's life, like it was nothing, and just discard them. Investigators collected male DNA belonging to the suspect from the crime scene. In 2003, authorities linked what happened to Shannon to the cold case of Renee Cavas. 27-year-old Renee's body was found on a road near Toro Marine Base in Irvine, California in 1989. When investigators entered the suspect's DNA profile in Shannon's case into the combined DNA index system, they noticed that the same man was responsible for taking the lives of both Shannon and Renee. Unfortunately, his identity could not be determined. In 2021, 
the Orange County District Attorney's investigative genetic genealogy team identified a Las Vegas man named Reuben J. Smith as a possible suspect. Smith lived in Orange County in the 1980s. He was forced to give his DNA in 1998 after being arrested in Las Vegas for assault and attempting to take the life of a woman. In July of 2022, it was confirmed that the DNA evidence from his arrest matched the DNA found at the crime scene of both Shannon and Renee. Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer said, Because of the advent of science, there's no case that's cold anymore. Every case is potentially solvable. Justice does not have an expiration date, whether a crime happened 40 years ago or 4 minutes ago. The residents of Orange County can have confidence that the law and for men in this county will not rest until justice is served. The loved ones of Rene Cuavez and Shannon Lloyd have the answers to the question they've been asking for more than three decades. The third unknown victim of his that survived said the evil in him. I know if I didn't fight, I was going to die. It was horrible. The things that he did, the things that he said. Though she was able to fight him off and escape, she said she is still haunted by him. One year after being arrested in 1998, Smith took his own life at 39 years old. This is infuriating the victim's families themselves said that all their questions can't be answered. They know who and where, but not why. Detectives are now looking into the possibility that Smith could be implicated in other cases. Like this video and subscribe our channel.